Welcome to episode 13 of the Tech Bubble, our first of season three. As you can see, for those of you watching us on YouTube, rather than listening via our podcast, we're trying something a little different for our next six episodes. For those of you new to the Tech Bubble, I'm your host, Ian Williamson, and today, given that we've gone visual, what better way to celebrate the possibilities of audiovisual than to focus on film? Quite frankly, Mr. Williamson, I'm surprised it took you a whole 12 episodes to finally bring your subject area front and center. On another note, big congratulations on getting ISTE certified. We're all Ooh. so proud of you. Thank you very much. This is Chloe Jazzy Lau, co-host of the Tech Bubble, and I have to say that I'm going out on a bit of a limb for this one, given that I dropped media back in year nine. <laughs> <laughs> Three years later, and I've nearly forgiven you, Chloe. That's after your contribution to the DLC. And that reminds me, we are of course not just talking about film today, but rather the cross-section between technology and film. And what a great guest list we have. First up, appearing on the Tech Bubble for the second time, it's Mrs. Curran, one of the school's most passionate advocates of technology. Mrs. Curran is a Google Level 1 and Level 2 certified educator and ISTE certified educator too. As her film, media, and TOK students will attest, she has introduced countless apps into her lessons and had an article published in the Times Educational Supplement during lockdown, which reminded all of us that EdTech helps support our teaching and learning objectives. She's also provided some great animation classes in school as part of our extracurricular program. And Mr. Williamson here reliably informs me that she is the best editor in the school. Not surprising, really, given her background in television. Mrs. Curran, welcome back to the show. We're so glad to have you back. I'm very happy to be here. Looking forward to it. Thank you. And Larissa, you're not the only Curran on the show today because we have Mr. Curran, a.k.a. John. John is not a stranger to South Island School, having completed many film pro activities as part of Mad Week. John is a professional cinematographer with many years of experience uh, working in film and TV from BAFTA winning interactive dramas to studio directing and examining lighting for stills and videos. John has just completed his doctorate in this area. Well done, John. Thanks very much. And I'd also like to say he is very much part of the uh, film and media family here in our department, helping to advise us on the purchase of new equipment, whilst also having pro provided a lot of training to both the students and the staff alike. And that includes the entire ESF, by the way. John's appreciation of aesthetics extends way beyond the camera itself, as he also provides the colour grading each year for Film Pro, which has provided some memorable visual looks to the films produced. But ultimately, like me when I'm directing those very same films, we kind of just do what Mrs. Curran tells us to do in the end, really for fear of our lives, John. What do you think? Oh, yeah, absolutely, yeah. <laughs> Welcome to the show, John. Thanks very much. I'm really looking forward to it. Speaking of a sensational visual look, our next guest has produced some of the most popular films in Hong Kong, especially for SIS students. In recent years, she has worked with her partner, James Ha, another member of our SIS alumni community. Alison Thomas set up Scene 852, which has become something of a production house for SIS film and media graduates. This was after Alison graduated as an IB student from our school back in the class of 2011 and went on to study film at Bournemouth University in the UK. So some of the major clients that Scene 852 has worked with include the Hong Kong Jockey Club, Adidas, AIA, HKU, and a lot more that I'm sure Alison could or may not get into. Um, welcome to the Tech Bubble, Alison. We're so glad to have you here. Thank you for having me. I'm very happy to be here. And our final guest today is one of our current IB film students and is about to start year 13. Nicholas Tam from 13C2 is one of our most prolific young filmmakers, having no less than three of the four Making a Difference nominations in the recent SIS Film Awards for 2021. Given the preponderance of cinematographers in the room, Nicholas will feel he is in good company, given that he also scooped the Best Cinematographer Award which, coincidentally, Alison also won back in 2010. Nicholas, great to have you on the show. Thanks for having me here today. It's um, like amazing to be sitting here with everybody here, but I do feel a little underqualified. Oh, <laughs> 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 Well, wow, what a great guest list. There are so many potential places to begin and talk about film as a medium just because it's such a broad field. But perhaps a good starting point is to consider the filmmaking culture here in Hong Kong. 
for young budding filmmakers at school, how feasible is it to make a career in the industry mm. itself? I'd love to hear from you, John, and then Allison. What have been your experiences and most memorable um, tidbits from working in the city? Uh, I think, I mean, before we started the interview, we, we, were, we were talking about this, and I think that what's, what for me was interesting when I first came to Hong Kong was I was expecting, one, I was expecting Hong Kong to be really massively technically advanced, and, uh, and when I first turned up at CNN to do some work with them, they, they handed me a camera that still had videotape in, and I was really, <laughs> I was really quite surprised. I was kind of like, oh, okay, I haven't used tape for a couple of years now in the UK. This is kind of a bit weird. Um, and then there's this, there was a shift in the, the crews were generally a little bit smaller. Yeah. Um, so, so, so there was a, almost like a little bit of a downsizing. Mm. But I think that very much depends on what you're doing in Hong Kong. So different, again, you've got different areas of, of the Hong Kong industry. So there are larger, obviously there's, there's feature production still, you know, and, and on those you do have larger crews. Um, but, on, but on a lot of the production in Hong Kong, the crew size is actually quite small and the turnaround time is very quick as well. Mm -hmm. so, you, so you tend to go from, from initial contact to completion very quickly. Mm -hmm. uh, which is, uh, whereas in the, in the UK you generally have a bit more time, especially mm -hmm. on the post end. So you'd have more time to actually edit and, um, and grade potentially. So, so that was a that was a that was interesting. I mean, yeah, we were talking. Cause, yeah, because I have the same experience as well. As soon as I came to Hong Kong, everything is faster. So the expectation to finish a project is faster. And I don't know if it's because Hong Kong's such a trendy place where, oh, there's a new trend, so we have to have the video out on time. Um, and like John said, everything, you know, the crews are smaller. But I don't know if it's got something to do with um, the space in Hong Kong because. You can't really fit a 20 people crew in a yeah, small cool. space and all the um, sort of lighting equipments you have to go a bit smaller or else the whole room would be overexposed um, but in terms of working in Hong Kong I do think that you need to put on a lot of different hats on so even though mainly I'm a director but I do need to switch roles quite often um, due to smaller production sizes so it's good that you get the whole spectrum of the you know, different roles like editing, cinematography, producer, um, director, you kind of switch roles more often in Hong Kong. Yeah, I mean, I'm, I'm finding that. So it's, yeah. a, it's for me, it's quite interesting because when from, from the UK, we were, I was working initially with what were considered to be small teams in the UK. Yeah. And they were, and, but I'd still have, every time I went out, that I would be doing camera and lighting, mm -hmm. but I would always have a sound engineer. Yeah, exactly. And the number of times I've had a sound engineer on Hong Kong projects, I think I can probably count on on, on one hand, maybe. Yeah. <laughs> it's because it, it's it's really the expectation for the camera to do sound exactly. on so many projects is just part of the role now. Definitely. It's it's you just kind of okay, you're going to turn up, and if you say, "Can I have a sound engineer?" I mean, it's it, also yeah, the same it's person. Like, what? <laughs> yeah, what's a sound engineer? It's going. Because yeah. <laughs> I have realized that a lot of camera trainees um, that have, like, you know, what they call a Sifu or a master they follow, they're also learning about, you know, they take out the sound equipment as well. Mm. And I think in the UK, you wouldn't see um, the cameraman ever touching the sound equipment. Mm. So it's more, you know, the roles are more focused. But I guess it's a, in a way a good thing in Hong Kong because everyone just knows a bit of everything. Yeah. So maybe in terms of someone like me who like to direct, it's quite good to know the whole spectrum of filmmaking. And I do think, you know, the film course that I've been to on SIS have also taught you to go try everything. And so did my university course. So quite lucky with that. <laughs> it's quite interesting you say that. I mean, I'm sure Nicholas can talk more about this, but the new course, since the specification change, um, one of the tasks is a portfolio-based one, which means that the students now have to be assessed in three different roles mm. across you know, the, the, the duration of the course. Yeah. So the days of being able to specialise as a cinematographer only or an editor only, which you know, sometimes students mm. are able to do, they're, they're well since gone. How, how have you found that, Nicholas, being able to you know, work across two or three different uh, roles? Has that been beneficial for you? I really feel like it was beneficial for me because usually in 
uh, back back in year nine or year ten or in during GCSEs even, uh, I would be mostly focused on uh, only once uh, like role in uh, film productions. Mm -hmm. So I really didn't actually explore uh, the aspects of kind of filmmaking mm -hmm. uh, even in school because I was. Uh, Always, I always just chose what was comfortable for me. Mm -hmm. And with IB, with this, uh, with the film portfolio, uh, I really did get to kind of develop my kind of character as a film, uh, as a filmmaker, uh, in a more holistic way. Because I was kind of forced to, you know, be a scriptwriter or a director, yeah. and I had to experiment with it and do some research on the role before. So I feel like it was beneficial in a way, and uh, for me to develop as a filmmaker, and especially now, I feel like. Filmmaking seems to be, uh, it's, it's a lot more accessible to everybody mm -hmm. now. So I feel like uh, it's good to have like a wide uh, skill set uh, so then you can kind of make your own films even with uh, kind of the technology that's available with, uh, to you now. It's so much cheaper mm -hmm. as well. When I first arrived here in 2004, I mean the film studies department was based in C11 mm -hmm. and we had absolutely no editing equipment at all. There, was not, there wasn't even a computer in the room at that point. Um, so what you were talking about, John, in terms of you know, editing via tape, essentially. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, I, th I think there were maybe two old like, you know, video recorders stuck on top of each other with the old wheel you know, with the linear editing yeah. process. Um, and that's changed so dramatically and so quickly. I just wanted to ask, I mean, any of you can jump in on this one, but um, the locations in Hong Kong are just fantastic, aren't they? I, mean, I think it's one of the yeah. things that I've loved the most about living here. Um, you know, being out on, on, on set. Um, I mean, you made a film recently, Alison, um, with Scene 852, mm -hmm. where you were jumping into, it was futuristic, and yeah. we actually played it, the film, oh, uh, really? with Nicholas's <laughs> film class, yeah. I mean, you use so many different locations yeah. there. Yeah, I mean, like, that film, we kind of planned it around five years ago, or six, seven years ago, when I first came back to Hong Kong, like there's so many locations, there's mm -hmm. so many possibilities and that's how mm -hmm. that film started. And it does give you the benefit of like creating crazy sort of story worlds because you look around the corner, it's like high tech looking and yeah. then just yeah. around the corner there's a really old street that could be the 80s, mm -hmm. maybe. Um, so it does give you a lot more story possibilities and settings and you could ch like cheaply film it. Basically, how have you found those location changes yeah, John, no, from no, the UK? The, the being able to that, that kind of that richness that you get mm -hmm. in a tiny space is one of the most amazing things about yeah. about producing in Hong Kong. It's uh, the ability to, I mean, visually change what it is you're doing by just by turning around, as you say, looking down the next street, and you're suddenly looking Ooh. at a completely <laughs> yeah. different space. It's 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 a, yeah, it's you know. Um, yeah, that's definitely one of the. I think one of the one of the best things about it, and also being able to do that, being able to do, being able to go city, new city, old city, beach, yeah. Yeah. mountain, uh, you know, in the same day. Yeah, exactly. it's, 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 it's it's an amazing, you know, and I think it's one of the few places that you can really do that. Yeah. It's kind of, you know, I mean, like again, we're in the UK, I was based in London, mm -hmm. you know. M mountains? <laughs> no, <laughs> yeah. Mountains? No. Yeah. You know, city? Yes. Beaches? No. Yeah. Mountains? No. You know, it's got, you know, you couldn't do. So you, you, uh, so yeah, actually being uh, have that having that that wealth of possibilities yeah. is is yeah. one of the most amazing things about about shooting in Hong Kong, and, and it does it, it lets you do it lets you bring bring different things to projects that you. You wouldn't be able to do yeah. in other in other places, I think, which is it's which a creative is creative catalyst, isn't it? Let's be yeah. honest. Yeah. Oh my God. Absolutely. Yeah. You, you you and you're always seeing things. It's it's yeah. kind of you know. I mean, I suppose that's the as a as a cameraman as a you know as a I I'm always I always have a camera with me. I mean, everyone has a camera with them because everyone's got their phone with yeah. them all the time. Um, but I always have a camera with me and I'm always looking around and seeing different shapes and different images yeah, and yeah. light falling in different ways in, in, in old buildings and new buildings or old buildings and new buildings yeah. right next to each other, which is one of the things I love, actually, yeah, you know. It's like on a filming day, you can really just fit in like four settings if you're crazy enough to yeah, <laughs> yeah, absolutely. Yeah, yeah, from yeah, location yeah. to location. Yeah. How, yeah. What's the most settings you've had in one shooting day in Hong Kong? Just quite um, curious. 
Now that would be that's probably a ridiculous number actually. <laughs> <laughs> uh, so. Uh, so, um, film pro John, we must have had sometimes you know, with so many different in film, in and, film you know, pro we did ten in one day. In film oh pro we did, yeah, we did, wow. yeah, we did. We've done a, we've done a crazy number because we did. Uh, obviously, we've done classrooms, mm. corridors, so internals. We did yeah. um, outside on the, we did on the hillside, on the hillside, <laughs> um, and on on commercial projects. I've done uh, uh, airport. Oh, yeah. Um, and then back into the city, oh, yeah. a container. So I did, yeah. So one I did airport container port, back in the city, um, for some for some from some evening shots yeah. as well. So yeah. So you kind of get this. So you obviously then you're spending a lot of time driving. Yeah, so, exactly. so that kind of is the thing. It means that you're kind of you arrive somewhere, you set up. You're quick. Grab some yeah, shots of the exactly. container you port. Just take yeah, out. and then kind of back in the van, drive <laughs> yeah. to the. And then start the like your equipment yeah. starts becoming like you know they stop going back into the tripod bags. It's like you're just holding oh, no, it absolutely. on the car. Yeah, 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 yeah. <laughs> yeah. yeah. No, especially when you're doing when you're doing news, it doesn't. Oh, you yeah, that must you be. just basically have the camera and the tripod out all the time. So yeah, you're, yeah, you're not. Yeah, yeah. You're just you know. It's kind of Nicholas, weird. I mean, for you listening to all of this, I'm I'm kind of curious to know, you know, what what is the sort of perception amongst you know, the young filmmakers at a school level, you know, so the, the students who are coming up, you know, years 10, 11, I mean, you've been with us now for the last four years doing film in one form or another. So, um, you know, what, what do you think are going to be like the kind of the pathways that are available to you going forward? Um, you know, how do, how do you see your future panning out? I, I'm not just talking about, I'm not saying that's a, a pressure, by the way, to go into the film industry. <laughs> yeah, um, but I'm asking more generally in terms of what you know, what the kind of discussions go on with regards to students in school as to making this feasible and having the kind of career that John and, and Alison are talking about? Well, I feel like one of the most talked about options, of course, is university, right? You go abroad and study film and media in university. But I feel like that sometimes isn't as feasible for some people because I feel like studying uh, abroad is already a kind of high risk and high, yet high gain uh, option for uh, or path for a lot of people. And I feel like um, a lot of people that I talk to feel like film media or uh, like if you study it, you go, you're, you're kind of entering a high, an, an ultra competitive industry. And a lot of people feel like that uh, financially it might not be worth it for them. So I, um, apart from university, I feel like just uh, getting that work experience in Hong Kong or uh, make, uh, making kind of experiments and uh, side projects on your own yeah. might be a better way to enter the film industry than university yeah. for a lot of people. Mm -hmm. So get your name yeah. 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 Can I Can I add on to that? What is, what's, what's the, getting experience is absolutely invaluable. Um, but the other thing, actually doing media at school and having that idea of media, whether you whether you then go to university or whether you go and then get some experience, what I would say now is that they're, they're not thinking of film as just film and television, but thinking of film as just part of almost every industry now. Because that, that's the thing, is that actually taking those filmmaking skills into, into business environments where you've got corporate companies who have internal video production teams, yeah, and you've got so the, the scope for actually producing videos is much much bigger now because that's the way we communicate, you know. And if anything, the, the pandemic has done it has increased the way that the visually and and by using motion and by using motion images is how we communicate. Um, so having those skills is kind of going to be more sought after as just an integrated part of, I think, almost any role. So. Uh, and so again, if you go to university and, you, and you, you get better at those skills, then you're potentially more saleable going into a range of industries, not just film and television, which I think is, which I think is something that some, sometimes people forget, that actually it's not, it's a base set of skills that you can use. And it teaches things like, obviously, teamwork, which you, which yeah. you must have found right. when you were doing your courses. Yeah. Uh, I, you know. I also found that when I went to university, um, we had the access to all the equipment mm -hmm. and all the, you know, crews for free, right? Mm -hmm. Like, not for free, but like, when you're doing projects, you could 
you know, whenever you have a project, you could just go to the studio and rent it, like, without the money you'd have mm -hmm. to spend when you're out working, because one of the biggest difference between being a student and when you're actually working is you need to start paying people, you know, yeah, and you got to start absolutely. paying for crew. Um, so university was a good way to have like your crew available when, whenever you want, as long as you like, you know, speak to them. If they're free, they'll do it for free, and everyone's learning. And it's a place where you can make mistakes and make some really bad films and be okay with it, <laughs> you know. Um, but then obviously, I don't think university has to be the path because there, I do know people who didn't study film who ended up doing film. Mm -hmm. So my partner James didn't study film, but he went straight into the field, learnt it very quickly. I think as long as you have a reliable team that would like let you come in, make a few mistakes, as long as you're like willing to go for it, then it's more about the attitude on set. Right. Yeah. yeah. So I yeah. Think increasingly we're seeing university courses um, become more interdisciplinary. So as John yeah. mentioned, having film integrated um, across the board. Um, yeah. There are courses like uh, Modern Culture and Media, which is uh, pretty big in US universities, mm -hmm. which are naturally already more integrated across discipline. And I think just this just helps people that don't even set out to become filmmakers um, see these fields and see these you know, see history, sociology through the lens of film, and I think that brings a lot of new perspectives and, um, you know, cross-cultural um, collaboration and cross-disciplinary yeah. collaboration um, across the sp film space. Um, so have you guys had experience with um, kind of looking at other disciplines at university? And of, of course, Nicholas, I know you're also considering um, geography and urban planning. So how do you guys look at that um, kind of integration across disciplines with film? Um, Nicholas, you want to go ahead? Well, I feel like, uh, especially now, mm -hmm. that like in the information is now kind of moving away from text, and now it's um, moving to more kind of visual or like audio-based yeah. uh, mediums. Mm -hmm. I think um, generally it's just a faster way to communicate between people, and it's more interesting than just mm -hmm. uh, reading. So I feel like in almost any kind of uh, industry or subject, or kind of um, whether it's academics or um, a business, uh, information is kind of being spread through film or uh, media in general uh, in, in, a, in a more kind of visual and audio-based uh, um, audio way. So yeah, I just, I feel like film is right, um, it's just becoming more um, of an essential kind of skill mm. in yeah. almost anything mm -hmm. you do now. Yeah, yeah. yeah very much so. It, yeah. It's, it is just part of it's part of every aspect of, of life, really. It's, it's, you know, everything from talking to your family, <laughs> you know, uh, wherever they are. And obviously, and again, the pandemic has accelerated that by, by a massive degree because everybody has been stuck in their own locations and the travel has stopped. So you, you've got this massive increase in being able to talk to people. So that's changed the way that we work. And also working from home, obviously. So for lots of businesses, you know, lots of people had to suddenly transition to communicating using video, you know, and it's not, and it's not going out and hiring a film crew to make something, but it's, a, you know, everybody has suddenly realized that actually, if you have your laptop on the desk under your nose, it doesn't look great. It's kind of, <laughs> <laughs> it's, and so the number of people who have laptops on piles of books, so that the camera is actually at a good angle, and these kind of basic things, but, but, they're, but they're the things that you learn about, about visual communication, about yeah. filmic presentation yeah. on courses, and then you learn, you know, whether, whether the course is at school or whether the course is at, at university. Um, and again, as whether or whether it's part of or whether it's a a filmic component in another program, which is which is something um, that's important. I mean, when, when we were when we were developing the television production degrees mm -hmm. in the UK, um, it was at a time when the industry in the UK was was moving to smaller production teams. Mm -hmm. So so we were narrowing production teams, and mm -hmm. people were beginning to multitask at that point, but. Um, but it was still very much a separate industry. And, yeah. um, but then as we went along, we, 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 we had more communication with other programs. Um, and so by the time I'd left the UK, which was over a decade now ago, um, we, were, we were even at that point, we were having communication with other programs yeah. who wanted to integrate 
some of the things that we were doing in their programs. So, you know, mm -hmm. I mean, that's just accelerated. Yeah, um, for sure. so. Yeah, Ms. Kern, I'm interested to hear your perspective. I'm sure you've advised a lot of students um, coming out of your film classes and going into film courses or interdisciplinary courses, whatever they choose to go into. Do you feel like film courses now um, are sort of shifting away from the technical aspect and going into the more cultural and social aspect? Um, and, and essentially, w what I'm interested in is, how do you feel like film courses have shifted with the advent of technology? Do you feel like the teaching mediums and the type of um, kind of instructions and the way they teach film and think about film has fundamentally changed um, as a result of technology at university? Um, I, th I think most universities have been pretty good at keeping up with technology because that's how they attract students, actually. Mm -hmm. I mean, you know, if you go around to universities to visit them, they you know, part of the selling point is the facilities that they can offer. Um, there's always been um, theoretical courses, you know, and, and actually that's where, you know, film studies started. Um, and so the, the practical courses, the courses more designed to, um, uh, you know, sort of train students or help students develop the skills needed to perhaps build a career in, in film, media or television, um, actually started in the old polytechnics in the UK. Um, I think it's a bit different in America because um, in certain parts of America, so Los Angeles and New York in particular, where there's always been a demand for mm. people with those skills. Sure. Um, and I think again, you know, it's different here in Hong Kong. Mm -hmm. um, I think that one of the most important things I say to my students though is, you're not looking at a university with a big name. If, mm. if you want to go to yeah. a university that, that, that is actually going to help you build a career, mm. you need to be looking at what are their alumni doing? Mm. Yeah? Yeah, what definitely. connections with industry do they yeah. have? Mm -hmm. Because there's a lot of factors, you know, obviously if you're going to create your own company, that's something different. But if, you, mm. you know, if you're mm. going to go in you know, working for other people as a freelancer or whatever, yeah, you've got to be good at what you do and you've got to be you know, fun to work with and <laughs> all of this kind of stuff. But if you don't know the right people, you're never going to hear about the jobs. Mm. Um, and then I think, as has been said by a couple of people, is that you know, f communicating th through a visual medium is not about knowing how to use a camera. It's about knowing how to tell a story. Mm -hmm. And so it's good to hear, you know, yes, you can make your mistakes. You can work out you know, what works, what doesn't work, where can I push the boundaries, yeah. where, you know, what, what is sacred kind of thing. And, and also just meeting like-minded people. Mm you know, which yeah. is inspiring, you know, and that gives you the motivation. And I think a lot of people also find out that they don't want to do it, yeah. you yeah. know, yeah. but and that's perfectly because valid. of those soft skills, yeah. you know, mm -hmm. yeah. um, problem solving, teamwork, mm -hmm. communication, mm -hmm. they are so valuable and that's what everyone, creativity, mm -hmm. you know, that's what people are lacking and, and everybody's looking for. So, yeah, yeah so I, I, I still think university is, is the most viable option, mm -hmm. actually, not because you're going to have a degree at the end of it, yeah. but yeah. you're going to have connections that you didn't have for before, sure. um, and you're going to have had the space to, to grow and to develop mm -hmm. um, in a way that you wouldn't. Um, I think I said earlier, I said one, one of the things that's a bit different in different parts of the world, in the UK, there's, there's a very strong apprenticeship yeah. system. Um, so, you know, pe people want to go into film particularly, mm. um, you know, can get onto apprenticeships and, and you know, you, you pretty much know you've got a job for life. You can go work for the BBC, you know, you're going to have a job for life, this kind of stuff. Um, and I, I think here, if students that want to stay in Hong Kong, it, it depends quite a bit on your language skills. Mm -hmm. You know, if you yeah. don't speak Cantonese, you're not yeah. going to get any kind of trainee position yeah. um, at yeah. all. Um, so. You know, I think that's viable if you know if you've got that, or if you've already got contacts. You know, if you already mm -hmm. know someone who, mm -hmm. you know, has a company, or and you can go work for them or do work experience for them, that kind of mm -hmm. kind of thing. You were talking about that even yeah. before we started yeah. this morning. Yeah. So, um, so one of the biggest challenges I have, I think, working mm -hmm. in Hong Kong is I can speak Cantonese, but with less confidence mm -hmm. because there are certain vocabularies where I'm like, oh, I forgot what yeah. that is, um, but. 
so that's one thing you really do need to consider is the language barrier. Mm. But if you don't speak Cantonese, it's still possible, but you really do need a support system of people who can immediately translate things for you or um, can speak confidently in Cantonese. So, for example, my partner James, he could read, write, and speak Cantonese very fluently. So a lot of the presentation things, he kind of overtakes it, and I sort of um, brief, you know, what kind of things to talk about, and he just gets straight on it and mm. charms people straight away. So, <laughs> like, you know, if, if you still want to work in Hong Kong, mm. make sure you do have um, the support system for speaking Cantonese yeah. because it, I have noticed that throughout the few years I've worked here, there has been more and more requirement for Cantonese. Um, and also, if you look at the MTR advertisements now, um, when I was younger, there's always English and mm -hmm. Chinese, right? But now I've seen ads where it's just pure Chinese mm -hmm. everywhere. Mm -hmm. So that's definitely one of yeah. the things to consider. John, I'm curious to know, how has your experience been with um, communicating with Chinese-speaking clients um, um, on commercial projects? It's actually the, it's the same, actually. Mm -hmm. um, obviously, I speak, I, sp I speak no Cantonese at all. Um, so when I first got here, my my initial contacts were um, through news agencies because I had contacts with Reuters, um, mm -hmm. and so I was doing some work with Reuters and then CNN and BBC. Um, so I was doing mainly news, mm -hmm. um, and then I built up some some corporate contacts as well. Uh, and what you tend to find is that when you're working with international news agencies, you're then talking with English-speaking uh, producers and, and directors. So you're so, so the language is not an issue then, but when you go to locations, mm -hmm. yeah. you need people in the team who can then speak Cantonese because of that. You need that communication yeah. to be able to. Yeah. Um, and then again with corporate, um, we quite often find that even if the director I wasn't working with, that maybe the gaffer I was working with was actually local and so mm -hmm. they would actually do all of, all of the local communication when we went to a site. Yeah. So. And that was a godsend because, yeah. because it meant that you would turn up and you would, rather than having these stuttered conversations, <laughs> trying to figure out where you were going and what you were supposed to be doing, I'd turn up and my gaffer would just go and have a quick conversation with whoever was nearby mm -hmm. and we'd know exactly where we were going and mm -hmm. we'd be in. So it was, uh, yeah, no, having that, having that communication support system in place, mm -hmm. massively important. You, you just, yeah. yeah. Um, but it does depend on, again, it does. There's a very, very small niche area where you don't need it yeah. and that is that is the international mainly the international news agencies but again even with the international news agencies once you're actually on site you need somebody who can speak Cantonese yeah. so yeah John just for some of the younger listeners or, or who listen to podcasts or those who are viewing this on YouTube if they've never heard the word gaffer before can you just give us a very brief <laughs> explanation of, <laughs> of what it means yeah, I'm just yeah. like me as well. <laughs> we always have an imaginary year seven student yeah. who's going to be in my tutor group this year they're not going to be imaginary any longer um, so, um, so I'd, like, I'd like them to know what these so things Gaffer's are. So Gaffer's basically a person, really important person in charge of lighting and electricity. So they are the person totally in charge of putting all your lights up, organising all of your lights, making sure that you're not drawing too much power and blowing all the fuses in a building, <laughs> which I have known people to do. So, yeah, um, okay. uh, so, so you... Uh, luckily, I haven't done that, so... <laughs> so I think we've got our next episode <laughs> showing that, by the way. Fingers crossed there. So, yeah, um, so, uh, so, yeah, so the gaffer is the person who is in charge of all of that. So if, you're, so if you're on set and somebody is going around and they're adjusting all the lights and they're mm. setting the lights up, that will be... If you're just working with a gaffer, which, you, which in Hong Kong, on a lot of sets, you're only working with a gaffer, mm. Um, unless you're working on a really big production and then you might be working with uh, a best boy and, every, and all the gaffers mm. assistants. So, um, yeah, so that's who a gaffer is. It's the person in charge of lights and electricity. Great. And they are Thanks massively, you. massively important. Yeah, so... Uh, and it also means that in terms of... As a, as a director of photography, uh, um, which is the TV... the UK TV term for the basically the cinematography and television. Yeah, yeah. Um, as a director of photography, um, it means that having a gaffer with you means that you can say, OK, this is what we need the lighting to do. Mm. And then physically, I'm worried then about the camera so I can get my assistant 
So I can talk to my camera assistant mm. and get them to set the camera the way I want it to look. And I can get my gaffer to be putting the lights where they need to be to achieve the look on the people that are, that are there. Um, so, so that's so that and having that communication system and that team separation means that you can get things done effectively um, and you can get you can achieve looks and that you wouldn't be able to if you were just running around on your own. Um, although, having said that, there's there's lots of interesting changes in technology that have changed things that you can and can't do mm -hmm. um, uh, with with lighting now, uh, which is uh, which, which has been like, which is a godsend. Yeah. But anyway, sorry, yeah. No, absolutely. I'll keep waffling. So. That's no. very helpful. Thank you. <laughs> that was a good segue, actually, <laughs> wasn't it, Chloe? <laughs> yeah. Um, so anyway, um, I, I'm guessing that given our technical focus on the tech bubble, a lot of our listeners will expect us to talk about you know, the hardware, software. Don't worry. Listeners will get into that. Um, <laughs> we're not depriving you of that. But um, right now, as, as Ms. Curran mentioned and a lot of our other guests did, um, technology is really not a means to an uh, really not an end in itself, but rather a means to an end. And that is to say it, it's used to aid good storytelling. And so John or Mrs. Curran, given your years of experience in filmmaking, I'm curious to know what were the biggest shifts and adjustments you had to make in your um, production processes when transitioning from the kind of pre-digital era to the post-digital filmmaking era? You know, whether that's technology, working with crews, um, and how do you think that's influenced the way you storytell through films? Um. For me as an editor, I mean, I, I started on those two, three machines that, that you had with videotape <laughs> in editing in a linear way. And so you, that, I actually think that was great for my development because mm. it forces you to think about what you're trying to say mm. and to plan how you're going to use the material you have yeah. to convey that. Um, you know, you, you haven't got the luxury of being able to constantly go back and change things and tweak things and yeah. all of this kind of thing. And I think it also um, gave me um, a sort of rigor in my editing in that, you know, I don't waste time. Mm. You know, I know what's not going to work. I know how mm. accurate things need to be. I mean, on those two and three machine editing mm. suites, trying to get frame accuracy was just so annoying. And, you know, when you've been editing for a while, you see every frame. Mm. So, you know, it's kind of like, <laughs> you know, when they, and, then, and then you do it again and then it slips the other way yeah. or it goes. So, so, I mean, that, you know, when I, I mean, I, I'm, I'm not that old. So, you know, I did fairly quickly move to, um, you know, digital editing, mm -hmm. non-linear linear editing. Yeah. Um, and, of course, the, just the beauty of that is just, you know, I, I th often think that editing's a bit like, I don't know, maybe driving a car or something like that, a, 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 a Formula One sports car, or something <laughs> like that. Because, you know, when you're, when you're working with that machine, you're crafting something mm -hmm. and you're shaping it. And so to have something that's responsive in a way that a Formula One car would be responsive, right? Um, and I think that's what the, the software that we have gives us. Mm -hmm. You have to know how to use it, of course. If you don't know how to use it, then it's just, you know, yes, you're going to, you know, be... Um, uh, I don't know if people drive with stick shift cars these days, <laughs> but, um, you know, you're going to be going, ur, 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 you know, with your car and that kind of thing. But, um, yeah, I think, I think that's, that's the, the biggest thing. I do think, though, that um, the shifts in technology have also meant that um, people th often think that editing is about changing how the image looks or mm. doing something that looks fancy, you know, something that draws attention to the editing. And I find that quite frustrating, actually, because that's not what editing is about. Mm. You know, really, if you can see the editing, yeah, there's times where you want people to see it, but, you know, if you can't do the basics where, you know, you're actually using the editing to tell a story and people yeah. are focusing yeah. on the story, not your editing, yeah. um, then you're not really an editor. You know, mm. you should go into visual effects or mm. something mm. like that instead. So I think, I think it's a kind of a double-edged sword. I think, you know, you've got that enormous control that, that you just, you know, didn't have with the, the two and three machine. Mm -hmm. um, uh, but at the same time, you know, I think s sometimes, you know, I think maybe, you know, good editors are perhaps 
becoming rarer, perhaps. Maybe it's <laughs> like invisible editing, like when you don't notice the edit is the best editing. Wow. Mm. When you just true. completely yeah. forget. You're yeah, in the, in that's. The yeah. And it's interesting that sometimes I'm asked about how we do the judging for the film awards from one year to the next, and obviously, um, you know, Mrs. Curran's. Uh, expertise in editing is always central to the decision on best editor, which is you know one of those blue ribbon awards from one year to the next. Um, and, and I would reinforce that point that you know quite often, you know, we, we have to force ourselves not to be wowed by just a, a really dramatic or very impressive moment in a film, but to look at the immersive storytelling that's going on. And it, it's an invisible practice often, you know, if it's being done well. Um, so yeah, I, I would completely reinforce everything that yeah. you just said there. Yeah. Mm. yeah. So what about camera technology? Well, I mean, as, as I said earlier, camera technology is changing. I mean, daily almost. It's uh, <laughs> it's uh, um, and it's a it's a it's a great thing um, in terms of we're at the point now where we've got cameras with 16 stops of dynamic range. So you've got massive dynamic range. Mm. Um, you're able to go in and then you can, um, you know, move and you get 10 bit plus color information. Mm -hmm. so, so you're then able to go in and actually in grade, create any look you want. Um, and, it's, and it's lovely to be able to do that. The, I think the, similarly to editing, mm -hmm. in a way it's, it's, it's beneficial and in a way it's, it's actually harmful to your progression as a camera person because you're um, because when I first started we were using video cameras that had a very very small dynamic range um, and so that it meant that when I when you were looking at an image to mm -hmm. to get the image to look the way you wanted it to you had to be very careful about how you lit the image how you controlled lighting in the image where you position things in the image um, and and the colours that you had in the images, um, and so you were forced to to really think carefully about. You were forced to think about every single aspect. Yeah. Whereas now you can point a camera and literally go, "Yeah, it's going to be okay." <laughs> it's it's uh, which is which is yeah. absolutely phenomenal. And I love, I love the beautiful images that you can get with with sixteen stops of dynamic <laughs> range. It's absolutely incredible. Um, uh, but it but it does mean that there is this tendency to to not think about mm, things yeah. um, uh, to not think about okay how do I what what is it I'm trying to achieve before I record there's a there's a there's a danger to 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 shooting with big dynamic range cameras that is that you take a documentary approach when you're not shooting a documentary mm. Mm. and the idea that you can get any look you can after but the issue is is that to actually get any look after is a lot of work. <laughs> um, whereas if you're actually going yeah. into, if you're actually going in and, and going, okay, I want it to look like this, and you have a picture of it in your head, and then you get it to look as close to your picture in your head when you're recording, it means that when you then do get to editing and when you get to grading, you're doing a lot less, and it's also already pointed in the direction that you want it to go in. Um, even whether you're shooting with a camera with terrible dynamic range or massive dynamic range, um, uh, and it's and it's absolutely and that so that's a that's an interesting expansion of the way camera technology has developed. Uh, I think it's really really interesting uh, the way that um, AI is being used um, uh, in, in image processing uh, and the way that you've got um, uh, uh, CNN's uh, uh, convolutional neural networks in AI um, assessing elements of, of, of picture um, to be able to recognize scenes and then, and then expose uh, pixel by pixel to yeah. a degree. Um, so, you're, so you're not now you're not now setting a base ISO uh, for, so you're not setting a linear response curve across the entire mm -hmm. image. Um, AI is actually able to look at the sensor mm -hmm. and go, well, that actually, that's a sum. And, and even though I want it to be really bright, I don't want it to be as bright mm -hmm. so that it's just completely burnt out. So I'm going to pull that section down, mm -hmm. you know, um, and being able to do things 
and that area of technology is absolutely incredible. It, it, it's, it's, it allows you to, to start with a good image. Mm. Um, from a camera point of view, I love it. I love the fact that I can take out a phone and that the phone is capable with it, with that AI processing of actually assessing an image, going, okay, I need to take four exposures, I need to then combine different aspects of those exposures to give me a really good image. That, that is incredible. At the other side of that is that, and, I've, and talking to different people uh, recently, over the last four years really, is that there is a, there feels like there's a, there's a loss in, Lighting more than anything, oh. the ability to light, um, because because the cameras are so good at capturing, whether it's a camera on a phone or whether it's a, a camera with a big dynamic range, um, you can you can just point the camera yeah. and know you're going to get a usable image mm -hmm. that you can do interesting things with in post, um, and so because of that, people don't light, and so you so so. So you just turn up to a scene and you record the scene. Um, and I used to always say when I, when I was teaching people that if you're not lighting, you're recording. Mm -hmm. You're not creating anymore. And I never meant that you had to use artificial lights, but it's if you're not controlling mm -hmm. the light in a scene, you're, 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 you're stuck with whatever it's doing. So it's so that's a, and I, and I think that 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 skill set of actually lighting is something that would, we're potentially in danger of losing to a degree, um, uh, and that's a real pity because yeah. actually, controlling the light is something, and and especially with lighting technology, lighting technology has changed, so much, um, especially with the advent of LEDs, yeah. which are massive in, in terms of their capabilities, mm -hmm. um, and. And I go out, and I've, often I'm shooting on my own. Um, and now I can go out with a one little case with my camera and all of my lights in. Um, and I've got a lot of these little LEDs, and I've got a couple of slightly bigger ones. And I can shape the image the way I want it to be. Um, when I started, the smallest thing you went out with was an estate car. And the entire rear of the estate car would be full of lighting equipment because that's how big lighting equipment was, and you had to have it. Um, yeah, you know, whereas now you can take out small LEDs and you can dial in any color that you want, um, at any brightness that you want, and you can position one. So you have this incredible creative toolkit now in terms of the way that camera technology is developed, in terms of the way that AI is being used, in terms of, in, in terms of image processing, and then also in terms of actually the way the lighting technology has has enabled your creativity and and your and your color and lighting um, intensity toolkit. So um, we, we've seen know. that even on Film Pro, haven't we? Yeah. I, mean, I think when when I think back to the original lighting that you needed in particular um, productions, you know, we were finishing films often on the Friday. You know, we were we were shooting films over a week's period. Um, so. I think it's interesting that the current films that we've done over the last two or three years have been done so much more quickly and we've been finishing them on the Thursday. And I think that's partly because it's not taking quite as long to get all of that lighting set up, um, probably because of the sensitivity of the cameras, etc. Yeah, yeah. Um, it's really interesting hearing the thoughts of, of both John and Larissa with regards to um, the sort of pre-era before digital technology and then you know the, 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 the current work. For the two of you, I suppose, as the uh, growing up in this digital generation of filmmakers, what are the things that you're most excited about in, in terms of your own work? Well, I feel like Mr. Kern touched a lot about using AI to edit and uh, use it to kind of help you with your cinematography. Mm -hmm. I feel like another really kind of exciting part is using um, is like VR technology as a filmmaking tool. Yeah. I think Allison mentioned earlier about um, the Mandalorian, where they used a kind of virtual set, they used an LED set to kind of uh, create their uh, their background and their setting. And you know, using an engine where you can kind of just put down any assets and kind of modify your environment uh, to fit your uh, and uh, kind of like just adapt to your scene 
is really exciting and um, I'm really kind of looking forward to seeing how that would change as you know potentially I, I could be kind of in that field when uh, everything kind of evolves and becomes more accessible to um, you know kind of everyone in the filmmaking industry. Is that your way of saying you want that in the budget for this year? <laughs> 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 Just say it if you want to. That would be perfect. <laughs> Um, yeah, I mean, like John's mentioned earlier that camera technology just changes every single year and in a way it's quite hard to keep up. Mm -hmm. So even if you look at the Academy Awards, there's like a section just for the science development in technology in camera and lighting and all that. Um, so in a way, I sometimes do find it hard to catch up, um, but then I think as long as you know the basics of, you know, you know, the basics of, you know, color balance yeah. or, I mean, white balance and like, you know, shutter speed, all that, you can always, you know, go on to the next stage or mm -hmm. like, um, so yeah, I, I do, I do get excited when there's like a new camera out or anything like that. But I usually find out on set from the camera people, mm -hmm. they're like, oh, have you checked out this new light? And I'd be like, what's this new light? And then they'll talk about it. But because you know the basic film terms and all the tech, you know, technical aspects, that's when you understand, oh, wow, this is a very powerful piece of equipment. Mm. Um, so yeah, it's, um, it is quite exciting how every week there's something new. <laughs> <laughs> Keeps you on your toes, for sure. Yeah, definitely. Yeah. Well, speaking of the influence of new technology, obviously you guys are filmmakers. Nicholas, you're starting to get into making your own films and um, actually publishing a lot of those. Um, so I was wondering, actually, uh, what do you think is the influence of social media in mm -hmm. being able to promote your work? So in season one and two of The Tech Bubble, we spoke a lot about the influence of social media. Obviously, as with all things, it has its qualms and its bads, but it's also a great platform for storytellers and filmmakers like yourself to use it um, to advocate for their work, to spread messages, um, but also just to connect with your audience on a more intimate level. So I was wondering, um, Allison, especially in your work through uh, Scene 852, how has social media influenced the way you share your work and how you communicate that? Um, I do think social media is a great platform for younger people in general because it gives us an opportunity to put our work out there where I think if 20 years ago mm. it'd be a lot harder for the younger generation to make a film and be like, hey, look at my work. Mm. Yeah. Um, so it gives young people an opportunity to show their skill set and um, how well they could you know, make something. And it also allows us to see so much. Um, yeah. and get influences about, you know, different types of films or technology. Mm -hmm. But, yeah, I just, I do think it's a great platform for young people. Mm, for sure. And Nicholas, you have your own, you know, digital portfolio and Instagram account. So what has been your experience with that? Well, I mainly set those up to kind of promote my content and just share it. But I, us I found that, that it's more of a tool for me to kind of network and find, you know, like opportunities to, you know, use film or like, um, take photographs, right? I would never uh, worked with like uh, the Azaleas, which was a fashion show that um, premiered recently. I would never gotten in contact with them without having you know, mm -hmm. social media, without having friends that you know, saw my content. Mm -hmm. And I also found that having social media was just, um, be, with it being so accessible, it was always like, a good way for me to kind of catalog my own um, experiences as well. And, and um, kind of like help like, help share my own visual journey in a very, very uh, accessible and convenient way to like a wider audience. Mm -hmm. And in general, I feel like social media and filmmaking is gonna be very intertwined in general because you know, with film, you're always gonna have to have an audience. And social media is just such a good way to share that mm -hmm. um, with people. And you can get down to even like very like kind of personal and in-depth levels with sharing um, on social media, yeah. Yeah, I think it's interesting, Nicholas, you mentioned the catalog, that you can kind of look back and see the progression of your work. Yeah. So you can have documentation from, I don't know, five years ago from when you first started off as a filmmaker, and then you have all that um, for the public eye to see, but you can also see, okay, this is how I've improved in these aspects. Um, and then just, you know, pl uh, plat platform your growth and be able to see that 
progression. So I think that must be interesting, um, especially with this new technology coming in and seeing how your films have improved over time and your technique yeah. as well. Yeah, I mean, like another point I'd like to add about social media is, I don't know if anyone realizes, but in Hong Kong there's all these channels where it's actually a group of people who works very similarly to a TV kind of way okay. but except they upload everything onto their YouTube channel yeah. and then yeah. they gain yeah. all their followers they've got like half a million followers mm -hmm. but in Hong Kong there's this culture of cr um, these channels where you know they sometimes create game shows they yeah. sometimes create short mm -hmm. films but they get content out every day wow. and it's just crazy but yeah. they, so essentially I feel like they're working like a TV network mm. except right. they're a group of young people mm -hmm. who's just like very hard working they work from day to night and they even have like talents that are there available all mm. day and um, it's quite interesting to see how there's this you know all these web series that yeah. come out yeah. and work like a TV network yeah, definitely. So, and I, I think we talk a lot about um, you know gatekeepers and the arts and and seeing the the type of barriers that are are pretty much have been taken away by social media and technology mm -hmm. and the accessibility of these platforms. Mm -hmm. You know, if you wanted to make a TV docu series, you yeah. would have had to book out a production studio, mm -hmm. hire a crew. But now you can come together with a group of friends mm -hmm. and have a platform exactly. like YouTube. And so you, definitely, yeah. Yeah. So like, I think in like previously if you want to do a series of something mm -hmm. you have to pitch it to you yeah. know a network mm -hmm. or somebody but now I think the pitching happens more for gaining finance mm -hmm. for it but you already have yeah. your platform yeah. to um, showcase whatever series you're trying to mm -hmm. do. With Scene 852 how much of the work that you are uh, generating how much is that coming through your social media content I mean are you getting you know, feedback, oh, I saw your stuff that you did with the Spartan Ray, so, <laughs> I did, so you know, how important yeah. is that in terms I mean, of getting what's, you? I mean, what's interesting is Scene 852 didn't have a social media platform for the first five years, oh, wow. because I felt like we needed a complete branding, mm. you know, for yeah. it to all look mm. like, oh, this yeah. is from Scene 852, so it took around five years to finalize our brand oh. but before that it was a lot of um word of mouth so mm. we started off with a lot of event capture and the good thing about event captures is there's so many people watching the after movie because they're trying to like see where, where they are in the yeah. event and so people see that through facebook and then they might contact that client and be like oh mm. who made the video and then we get that yeah. contact and i guess it does help because it does spread and people realize oh it says it's by scene 852 and mm -hmm. then they go on the internet and they, they find, they find out, out. Oh, it's, i think that's yeah. good advice actually for young filmmakers yeah. maybe don't rush into it you know take your time to mm. develop your yeah. brand identity definitely first. Um, and of course social media is also being used i mean for some of the other guests that we've got in here i mean you know i, I, I follow both john and, and larissa on twitter um <laughs> so there's also the, the 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 kind of analysis stuff that goes on mm. and, and reposting yeah. of important you know um I suppose messages and advocacy associated with the film industry and, and, and lots of other uh, issues too. Um, I, I guess there is a downside to all of this as well, though, isn't there? Um, and I think maybe we, we'd need another entire episode to go into that. Which might be a pitch coming forward. Um, for regular listeners to the show, they'll know that we finish with a segment where I ask every guest to say something very briefly in a, in a, in a minute or so. So I'm going to go back to the imaginary Year Seven student again. <laughs> as I always do. Um, I'm in year seven and I'm a fairly talented young filmmaker and I would like some advice in terms of how I take my skills forward. So what would be the advice that you would give them? One minute for each of you. Um, Alison, can we start with you? Yeah, I would say keep making films, um, yeah. keep making mistakes. Find, when you find a crew of people, be respectful for your crew members because they are so important for your film. Mm -hmm. And just keep making films, because maybe it might not be your thing, you'll find out through actually physically being there. Um, so yeah, keep making films, that's, that's my main advice, really. Yes, which is what you did. Yeah, you that's what I did. Incredibly prolific when you were even, in school. Even if it's like silly films, there's a lot of like embarrassing old <laughs> videos I used to make when I was a teenager, but it really helped with my skill set. Mm -hmm. yeah. Like I look back and me and my um, old friend Laura, we'd like laugh about it. We'd be like, oh, there was a story. There was Laura Grant by any chance. Laura yeah. Grant, yeah. yeah. Another great so, filmmaker in her day uh, as well. She was, she's, so, she's so clever. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> great student. Yeah, but um, so 
yeah, we just look back and we find it so funny. But you could see that back then, even when you don't have the knowledge, you still had that slight story arc yeah. in those films, and you see yourself develop and you know get better and yeah, just keep making films. Yeah, I think pretty much on the same advice. You have to kind of. I feel like the most important thing about getting better at making films is trying to you know take every opportunity to you know experiment and uh, actually film and you know take photographs or make videos and just uh, develop your skills on site and not just sit, you know sit in your room and just think about you know developing your skills and when you're starting out you you don't have to be as caught up about having the equipment to do so mm. it's uh, more about learning to how to tell a story and um, using the basics to tell the story mm. So even the, the, the most like technical stuff doesn't even matter that much in the sense that if you can tell a story using a visual medium, that's m a much more like uh, important skill than it is mm -hmm. to use, um, you know, a camera, a, a, a DSLR properly. Um, yeah, and now uh, nowadays you can even search up you know tutorials online on YouTube mm -hmm. uh, to f to uh, you know to figure out how to how to use uh, you know how to light light something properly. So. Developing those soft skills, those like creative aspects of filmmaking is a lot more important mm -hmm. than it is with technical skills. Yeah, For well sure. said. Yeah, absolutely. Just keep making stuff. Mm -hmm. um, don't, don't just make things for yourself, make things for other people as well, because mm -hmm. that's a real discipline. Mm -hmm. um, and um, share it. Yes. Yeah, mm -hmm. make sure people are seeing it. You know, gauge people's responses. Mm -hmm. um, and, and keep, you know, show an interest in what's happening you know, um, in, you know, content creation. Mm -hmm. Yeah, what are the trends? Where's the technology going? Yeah, what, what new equipment has come out that could make your life a lot easier or enable you to do things that you didn't do before? Mm -hmm. Yeah, and use it, use it to give yourself a voice or to give others a voice. I think that's so important, the idea of sharing it as well. That's why we keep doing the film awards. A lot of people think it's all about just the, uh, you know, the accolade of being the best editor or the best cinematographer, but really it's a celebration of filmmaking and getting the hard work that's produced by the students in our school out there and seen because well, it's a, wonderful. It's and it the needs students to be seen. that tend to win those awards are the ones that are not doing it for the award, yeah. they're doing it because they have something to say. Absolutely. Yeah. John? Um, yeah, so I'd say definitely you want to make as much as you can. Um, I would say do have a go at the technical roles. <laughs> um, not because you need to be brilliant at them, but because have a go at camera, have a go at sound, have a go at editing, uh, you know, because you might realise that actually, you might go in thinking, I, I want to be a camera person, but actually if you have a go at sound, you might actually realise you really want to do sound. Mm -hmm. um, and if you're not having a go, then you won't discover that. So, and playing with those different areas will make you a better filmmaker whichever role you end up doing yeah. because if you if you know how sound works and camera works and editing works you're going to be a better director and same if you're if you know how the other areas work you're going to be a better camera person mm -hmm. so getting a, a perspective and a, some experience in everything is actually really useful sounds like a good pitch for the film course that we run <laughs> I know, right? anyway, well done john it came back round to that in good the end we got there um, that's just about all we have time for today. So I'd like to, to start by just thanking all of my guests, uh, John and Larissa, Alison and Nicholas, um, all excellent contributions. I think we must have at least two shows worth of content there. <laughs> so amazing. And thank you very much also to my co-host, uh, Chloe Jazzy Lau. Thank you also to our production team that has been working so diligently behind the scenes, led by Abby Wan. This includes Anakin Wan, Mahika Candlewall, Vivian Chung, Karina Au, Izzy Pollan, Jessica Locke, Ashika Mamgain and Justin Mann, along with Karen Chan. We're going to be back soon with the second episode of the third season with more tech-related content. Stay safe wherever you're listening or watching the show. And in the meantime, as ever, we'd love to hear your thoughts on the show. What would you like us to discuss? If you have any ideas, questions or feedback, then please write to digileaders at webmail.sis.edu.hk. And don't forget to rate or like the show wherever possible. As always, thanks for joining us and see you next time. Yeah.